Welcome to the Cedar Fort Come Follow Me Made Easier podcast. I am your host, Linda Cherry. This week, we are studying Genesis 18 through 23, the sobering stories of Lot and the destruction of Sodom and Abraham and his sacrifice of his son, Isaac. There are so many things to contemplate in these chapters, and Sam Castor, our teacher for today, will be taking us along that journey with an emphasis on what it was that each of these people were setting their hearts upon. What was it that they loved most? As a little bit of background that I'd like to share about Lod and his family, and specifically about his wife looking back towards Sodom, I'd like to just point out that when the men of the city came to ask that they might know or harm the uh, holy men or sometimes referred to in the scriptures as the angels who had come to visit Lot, that at that time Lot offered two virgin daughters who were not married. And in just a couple of verses later, um, we read that Lot also had sons-in-law who were married to other daughters. And so as we think about Lot's wife and uh, as she is leaving the city and sees fire and brimstone raining down from heaven, it's honestly pretty hard to imagine being a parent and not turning back thinking of the children that are left in the city. Noah and his family undoubtedly had a similar experience for we read that Noah had granddaughters um, that were marrying outside of the covenant, but we don't know anything else about them in terms of what happened that they are not on the ark. This whole story, as Sam Castor will point out, really tells a lot about families. While Abraham later is asked to sacrifice his son Isaac, in reality, Lot and his wife did sacrifice their children for the benefit of living in Sodom and lost them. And this is quite a a story of um, sober realization of the daily decisions we make as parents that are affecting our children for positive or negative. Now, as we talk about Abraham's uh, sacrifice of Isaac or the proposed sacrifice of Isaac, there are some sweet details to consider, specifically that um, the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, verse 19, tells us that Abraham had the faith necessary that he, number one, believed the promise that the Lord had given him, that from Isaac, his birthright son, this wonderful, extensive posterity was promised to come. And at the same time, Uh, It tells us in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 19, that Abraham believed that if he was indeed required to sacrifice Isaac, that the Lord could raise him from the dead so that that promise might be fulfilled. Isn't it wonderful to think of that sort of faith in the promises that the Lord has made to us? I wonder if we are living with that degree of confidence in the Lord today. Sam Castor, again, our teacher for today, will point out about how Abraham's first love was the Lord God, and that through that first love, Abraham's heart was filled with a love for his own family, for Sarai, for Ishmael, for Isaac, for all of his posterity, but also all of the people that surrounded him. And this is why, as um, Elder Maxwell has told us, that when we're speaking of the first and second great commandment, the love of God is absolutely necessary as the first commandment in order for us to fully love others. I'd like to speak about Isaac and how his willingness to be the sacrifice foreshadows the sacrifice of our savior, Jesus Christ. Abraham is called the father of the faithful. And of course, our heavenly father is the father of the faithful, and he is the father of all mankind. Abraham's covenant son was Isaac, and our father's only begotten son, his firstborn son, and if you will, the son who would be fulfilling the covenant is Jesus Christ. 
It is believed by most scholars that Isaac was most likely in his 30s when this sacrifice took place. And in fact, many scholars think that it's very possible that because there is such a connection between the sacrifice of Isaac and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, that Isaac may have in fact been exactly 33 years old, the same age that Jesus was when he gave his life for his people. It's told in the scriptures that Isaac carried the wood upon his back uh, that was going to uh, burn the sacrifice, even as Jesus carried the cross upon his back to Golgotha. And that Isaac being in his 30s and his father being well over 100, that if Isaac had resisted in any way, he could have easily overpowered Abraham. This tells us that Isaac was very willing and in fact, probably likely laid himself upon the altar and submitted himself entirely to the will of his father, even as Jesus laid himself upon the cross and submitted himself to the will of the father in behalf of all mankind. Abraham did not have to complete his sacrifice. He had proved himself to the Lord and so did Isaac. Isaac had proven himself that he was worthy to be the birthright son, son and to continue the covenant through the generations. And so it is that our dearly beloved Savior, Jesus Christ, also proved himself. He is the lamb that was slain from before the foundation of the world, meaning that Adam and Eve and all of those who came after them and before the actual atonement and crucifixion of the Savior took place, were able to partake of the atonement of the Savior as if it had already been performed. Isaiah tells us that Jesus set his face like a flint to perform his mission on earth. And so we have this beautiful foreshadowing in the story of Abraham and the sacrifice of Isaac. As we discuss this great Abrahamic test and trial, our father does also expect many of us to experience trials that help us to grow and gain knowledge and understanding and increase our relationship with him. Some may be as difficult as Abraham's test, but we are promised that even as Abraham, we will be blessed. The Lord will be with us. He will carry us. He will help us in every way to be able to go forward to fulfill our missions and to receive the promises that he has in store for us. We want to remind you to subscribe by hitting the link below. And also if you hit the bell next to the link, you'll get an email notification as to when a new post has been um, posted on the website. We thank you for tuning in to our Cedar Fort Come Follow Me Made Easier podcast. And we turn our time now to Sam Castor, the author of Zion Rising. Hello, I'm Sam Castor, and welcome to the Come Follow Me lesson for this week on Genesis chapters 18 through 23. I like to view these chapters as posing the question of what do we love? I'm the author of Zion Rising, which explores how all ancient matriarchs and patriarchs sought Zion and how we can help Zion rise now in our time as well. Today, we get to discuss perhaps the most well-known patriarchs and matriarchs, Abraham and Sarah. Last week, Casey Griffiths discussed the Abrahamic covenant and how Christ assures us that if we continue to have faith in him, he will deliver on every promise he gives us. Christ in those chapters restored Abram and Sarai to become Abraham and Sarah. And Abraham himself was almost sacrificed by his father, Terah, which creates an extra layer of awareness of how painful and difficult it would have been for him to be asked to sacrifice Isaac, as we'll discuss in these chapters here today. What's interesting is Jewish tradition suggests that the angel that saved Abraham was actually Enoch, his great, great, great grandfather. And so there's a beautiful ribbon of Zion throughout these chapters as well, about how Abraham and Sarah are trying to regain their place in heaven above with their family, with their children, with their posterity. The Abrahamic covenant is all about true love. Abraham surrendered his love of things for the love of others and eventually for the love of God. 
And we see that pattern in these chapters here. In Genesis chapter 15, verses 8 through 18, and in Joseph Smith's translation of Genesis 17, verses 3 through 12, we read a story of how Abraham sacrificed some of his most precious possessions, his livestock at the time. This was before he had children, and the livestock were raised by him, cared for him, and nurtured by him. In many respects, probably treated like part of his family. That wealth that he had in his livestock, Abraham was asked to sacrifice or cut asunder so that he could make a covenant with the Lord. Incidentally, in Hebrew, cut and covenant contain the same root word. This idea of cutting or rending, rending asunder something that we find precious and surrendering it to the Lord is indicative of this covenant that the Lord makes with Abraham. We are asked to surrender, to cut apart those things. It's almost as if God is inviting Abraham and us to surrender the dust we think we have that will bring us happiness here below to receive all he has from heaven above. These chapters are all about what we love. And there are many examples of all types of love in these chapters, from the carnal and the familial to the godly and the divine. What we are willing to receive from the Lord is a function of what we love most. We can love things, animals, lands, possessions, positions, and power. We can love ourselves and our family, our servants, our spouses, our children, and all the posterity that come after us. And we can love God. Abraham shows us the correct order the most proper way for us to receive all the Father hath by loving God and loving others as ourselves. And there are other examples of those who do not do this in these chapters. Examples of the degrees of love include Abraham and Sarah's yearning for children. This is an example of loving others as evidenced in Genesis 18 verse 14. Abraham prays also later on in these chapters for the righteous including Lot and Sodom. He's praying for others because he loves others. This is also an example of that divine love and compassion and charity that Christ wants us to receive. Abraham also evidences the most divine and, and compassionate love of all by loving the Lord and in his willingness to let go of Ishmael in Genesis chapter 21, and then his willingness to sacrifice Isaac in Genesis chapter 22. These are examples of how Abraham's primary love, his primary purpose was to love God and give glory to him. Everything Abraham did was for God. Contrast this with Abraham, this, this uh, beautiful love that Abraham and Sarah exhibit with the love others exhibited. We're not going to get into it in greater detail, but <clears throat> there is a, a fantastic discussion <laughs> it's very interesting about some of the first transactions that happened in the bible with a king named abimelech he loved his wives and his children his lands and his possessions more than he loved doing what was right and it got him into trouble in a couple of instances in these chapters there's also an example of how lot and his wife loved sodom more than they loved being with the Lord. This was an example of a love of possessions, of popularity, of position. And then there's also the most heinous example of Sodom and Gomorrah and their self-consuming wicked love, which is destroyed by the Lord in Genesis chapter 19, verse five. All of these types of love draw us closer to a clearer picture of the love that the Lord is trying to help us foster in our own hearts. So let's start with Abraham and Sarah's version of love. It's widely accepted. Abraham and Sarah uniquely loved others. Jewish and Islamic tradition both hold that if you treat someone as a guest, you are a descendant of Abraham and Sarah, especially those that you don't know. If you're hospitable, that is a concept that was ingrained or taught, handed down by those who are descendants of Abraham. This is because Abraham and Sarah invited all into their home and cared for them. In fact, one of the reasons Abraham and Sarah did this was because they were yearning for children, even though they were so advanced in age and didn't have any, that this yearning created a desire for them to be to view themselves as stewards or parents of the whole earth. 
and they cared for what they refer to as, quote, the souls that they had won, end quote. That's in Abraham 2.15. Abraham and Sarah were constantly trying to love others. A beautiful example of this is also contained in Jewish tradition, which holds that Abraham and Sarah won souls with gardens when they would wander around in the wilderness as they were trying to gather and win these souls, they would plant gardens and they would act as parents of the earth by inviting others into these gardens. They would actually build a fence around the garden with a gate to the north and the south and the east and the west. And Jewish tradition notes that Abraham and Sarah cultivated these others to awaken others to Christ and remind them of why they were here on earth below. These gates would welcome others into the, into the garden. And once they would come in, Abraham and Sarah would sit there and, and discuss with them about how beautiful the garden was and how wonderful it was. And obviously this hospitality, this, uh, this generous gesture from Abraham to care for others would result in them thanking him. Well, after they had enjoyed the fruit of the garden and expressed that gratitude, Abraham would exclaim, according to these traditions held by Jewish rabbis, why are you giving me thanks? You should thank your true host who alone provides food and drink for all creatures. His guests would ask, well, where is the true host? I thought it was you. And Abraham would answer, he is the ruler of heaven and earth. And then he would teach them how to give thanks to God and how to trust in the dews of heaven. This exercise did help Abraham and Sarah save many souls and win them over to Christ. The Lord tells us that Abraham and Sarah also were anxious for their own children. And it's no surprise in Psalms 127 verse three, the Lord himself tells us that children are an heritage of the Lord. The most precious possession that we can have here relationship wise down here on earth, other than our relationship with God is the relationship with our spouse and with our children. So it's no wonder that Abraham and Sarah yearned for their own children so much that Sarah wanted to do everything she could to help Abraham have children, even in giving Abraham Hagar, her maid, her hand servant. For many back then, and even today, family is the top love we feel. It's totally understandable. Families are amazing. And all you have to do is look at photos of beautiful little children or happy families and say to yourself, I want to be a part of that. I want to be in a community. I want to be in a family that loves me, that I can love, that I can enjoy, and that I can be a part of. Abraham and Sarah were reasonable to wait and want and yearn for this family. In fact, the Lord promised Abraham in the prior chapters, and again in Genesis 18, that he would have children, that he would have posterity as the sands of the sea and of the and innumerable like the stars in the heavens. In Genesis chapter 18, verse 1, we actually read, according to the Joseph Smith's translation of that verse, that the Lord visited Abraham and told him many things. Abraham had a personal knowledge and interaction with Christ and loved and trusted him. He had saw him face to face. He knew his goodness, his generosity, and his love. And I believe that interaction with Christ transformed Abraham. It taught him to be more like Christ, to love and be generous and courageous and walk fearlessly into the conflicts that Abraham faced. When Abraham was almost 100 years old, he had been waiting a very long time for the Lord and the promised posterity that, that the Lord had, had given to him. And he still didn't have any children. Well, in Genesis chapter 18, Abraham finally has a conversation with the Lord. And the scriptures are a little unclear about whether the conversation was with the Lord or with three angels. But there are moments in here where the, the, the verses actually say that Abraham was having a discussion with the Lord and these angels. Abraham entertains these three angels, and it's also unclear if he understands who they are, or if maybe they're angels, as it refers to in the scriptures, that are visitors that are unawares or guests that are unawares. But a Abraham's generosity and his hospitality and his generosity to those he doesn't know is something that he exhibits to these three men. And he washes their feet, he feeds them, he kills a fatted calf, he gives them water. And the Lord in these verses in verse 10 tells Abraham and Sarah and reminds them that they are going to have a child and that their generosity will be rewarded. Sarah, who's in the tent, perhaps helping prepare the meal or resting in the shade, overhears and laughs in disbelief 
when the Lord or the angel says to Abraham, you're going to have a son. In response to hearing that laughter, the verse says that the Lord then turns to Abraham and asks, is anything too hard for the Lord? That's in Genesis 18, verse 14. Often I've found that that phrase is almost, a, it's, it's a way that the Lord helps us enjoy the miracles that he gives us. Often God waits for those moments when none but the Lord can deliver us. It's almost like it's more fun that way for him. It's like he's waiting for us to open a Christmas package, but he wants the suspense. He wants the tension to build to a place where it's maximum enjoyment for him and for us, because when it's revealed what's in that package, when it's revealed what he has in store for us, it is the most refreshing, rewarding, and connecting experience for us. And I believe we knew that that's what we were getting into when we came down to earth. Just like when you go into a movie and you know you're going to experience sorrow or tension or drama, and you maybe bring tissues because you know you're going to cry in a movie. I feel like our knowing consent to this earth life included an awareness that we would let the Lord use our stressful experiences to draw us closer to him and have these aha moments where we laugh and we cry at the same time because he has given us such an amazing gift in contrast to the stress or the darkness that we had felt up until we are able to receive and enjoy that gift. That's why we wait on the Lord. And that's why he tells Abraham and Sarah, nothing is too hard for him. He will make everything work for our good if we trust and love him and follow him. As important as family was, Abraham's greatest love still was to serve God. And after he receives this promise in Genesis 18, verse 19, the Lord actually starts to tell Abraham some things about what's going to happen following uh, his, his birth of his son and, and things that will happen onto the generations. In Genesis 18, verse 19, it actually says, for I know Abraham, Abraham, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. The Lord is saying, I know Abraham. I know I want to give my children to him. I want to have my, my posterity come down through him. I want to take advantage of his goodness, of his heart, of his genes, of all the things that he has cultivated in his life. I want to have the, all these nations come through him because I know Abraham will teach the children that are born to him throughout the generations how to serve and love the Lord. This is so true. And this, this concept of passing on faith in the Lord and the desire to take care of others it's so true that when Abraham's posterity, Isaiah, Elijah, Moses, even Nephi in the Book of Mormon, when they refer to Abraham and his God, they always refer to Abraham and that God of Abraham as the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Abraham's God, our God, is a God of families. He's a generational God. He's designing his family tree to help us come closer to him. And the relationships aren't just one off with one individual. They're meant to be familial, generational. They're meant to tie us all together as one. Meanwhile, while Abraham is having this experience, Lot, his cousin, is in trouble. The Lord tells Abraham that he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And guess who's living in Sodom? Lot is with his family. In Genesis chapter 18, verses 23 through 26, it says, And Abraham drew near and said unto the Lord, after the Lord had apprised him that he was going to destroy Sodom, he, said, he asks, Will thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure, there be 50 righteous within this city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the 50 righteous that are therein? And the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. So there starts to be this exchange, this negotiation between Abraham and the Lord. And Abraham says, hold on a second. You can't destroy Sodom. My cousin Lot is over there. And, and Abraham starts to humbly negotiate. He starts a little bit farther away than just the one Lot a relative that he has. He starts with 50. And Abraham negotiates with the Lord, reducing the number from 50 to 45 to 30, then down to 20 and finally to 10 and pleads with the Lord and says, as long as there's just 10 people in that city, will you not destroy it? Will you please preserve it because of the righteous and give them a chance to survive? 
The takeaway from these verses is beautiful. This is an exchange that shows how God's generosity and how his love is even greater when he negotiates and pleads uh, with his prophets. God wants to give us what he wants and what we want. He wants to give us what we love. And the Lord's prophets are trying to do the same thing. They're trying to help us find our happiness, our peace, and our joy. You need to contrast this. There's so much value in contrasting this exchange that Abraham has with the Lord about his promised posterity, about how his wife, who's almost you know, 100 years old, is going to have a child, and how she laughs when she hears that because she doesn't believe it and she's embarrassed, and how the Lord then tells him that he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. You need to contrast this exchange, this full discussion with the Lord and Abraham, with the exchange that Lot has in Sodom when two angels show up in Genesis chapter 19, verses one through three, Lot does a wonderful thing. He treats these angels as guests, just like Abraham did. But Lot is in Sodom and the environment is corrupt. And this poses serious problems for the exchange that Lot's about to have. In fact, Lot is worried about these two men, these clean angels that show up in the corrupt city of Sodom. And they entertain with him and then they say they're going to stay outside and lot says no 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 no, you need to come inside it's the sun is going down you need to come inside and where it's safe i always wondered why lot would be so worried about the safety of these angels and or these strangers if he didn't understand they were angels and he wasn't worried for his own safety he wasn't worried for the safety of his family his daughters his wife there's something off in lot's perception of what's going on around him and I think it has to do with what he loves. There's something in Sodom that Lot cherishes, something that he values, so much so that he's willing to put his family at risk. Do we do that? Are there things that we have in our lives that put our family at risk that we're not willing to let go of? I know I have done that at times, and I'm constantly trying to place myself into a position of humility so I can sacrifice whatever I need to sacrifice to be able to let the Lord take care of my family instead of having me distracted over something that puts them at risk. Well, the angels in this exchange in Genesis chapter 19, they agree to come inside and Lot continues to care for them as guests. But almost immediately, the men of Sodom, both old and young, surround Lot's house and they press upon it. They start to bang on the doors and the walls and they start to ask for those two men, those two strangers, to be delivered to them because the old men and the young men in Sodom want to molest the angels and quote, know them sexually. They want to do evil, vile things to these men. And so Sodom evidences its love. It's about self-consuming, self-corrupting, disregard for the safety of others or the wellness or peace of others, consumption and destruction. That's what Sodom's love is. And so <clears throat> Lot tries to appease these, these uh, crowds, they're rioting, and he offers up his daughters and says, <clears throat> please entertain yourself with my daughters. Do not touch these holy men. But before he can do that, the angels smite the crowd with blindness in, in Genesis 19, verse 11. And the, then the angels grab Lot and his wife and his daughters, his son-in-law's couldn't care less. They're not interested in, in being saved. They, they are fixated on Sodom as well. <clears throat> but Lot grabs his wife and his daughters and the angels grab them by their hands. And the scriptures say in Genesis chapter 19, verse 16, that the angels bring them forth and quote, set them without the city, end quote. I often wonder it's, if it's almost as if the angels transport them or fly them up through the, the air to get them out of the city into safety. Just like at times in the scriptures, there are those who disappear or are transported miraculously. It seems like something like that happened here. They then charge Lot to quote, look not behind thee and escape to the mountain, end quote. That's in Genesis 19 verse 17. Now we, know, we all know that the mountain is a symbol of the temple or a place of safety where the Lord resides. And this charge to Lot and his family to flee and not look behind them, but to go straight to the mountain or the temple where the Lord is, that makes sense. The angels are saying, we got you out of there. You're safe now, but don't go back. Don't look back and be distracted. 
Well, Lot flees the wickedness to a neighboring city, and then the Lord rains down, quote, fire and brimstone, end quote, out of heaven, again in quotes, on Sodom and Gomorrah and utterly destroys it in Genesis 19, verse 24. That destruction is something that is obvious and noticeable and I'm sure created quite a lot of that, a lot of noise. And while they're fleeing, Lot's wife, despite the instructions of the angels, the explicit instruction not to look back, Lot's wife looks back and she's turned into a pillar of salt. I don't know if you've seen the primary pictures where a little primary child has actually drawn a picture of Lot's wife looking back and she's turned into like a salt shaker. There's something interesting about this symbolism of her being turned to dust or to salt. But it's important for us to recognize, just like it talks about in the Come Follow Me manual from the church, that this happened, according to President or Elder Holland, this happened because uh, Lot's wife had her heart set upon Babylon. It wasn't just the looking. It was the looking and the longing. It was the desire in her heart that corrupted her and turned her into nothing but salt. This poses a question to me. What kind of person is saved miraculously by angels, transported miraculously out of a wicked city that's trying to destroy them, that's trying to take advantage of their guests and their daughters and do evil, vile things to them? What kind of person experiences that and then longs to go back? That kind of person is someone who loves Sodom. It's someone who loves the filth and the darkness. Now, I believe that the Lord can cure our hearts. And if we have those desires or appetites, he can help us find ways to reawaken to our true love and that we can love him. We can love the light and the truth and the joy that he offers us. But there are those people who will choose to go back to Sodom's destruction, self-consumption and sorrow. It's important for us to love them as well, but it's also important for us to choose to head to the mountain and to let them choose where they want to go. After this exchange happens in Genesis 19, we can flash back to Abraham and Sarah and Isaac now in Genesis 21. Isaac is born as promised in Genesis 21 verse 2. Sarah says in rejoicing about this event, that, quote, God made me to laugh so that all that hear will laugh with me, end quote. This laughter is a laughter of joy. That's in Genesis 21, verse 6. Sarah finally has her precious little one. She finally has the child she's been waiting for for almost 100 years, miraculously delivered to her in her old age. And this child is going to bring great blessing and happiness to her life. And that type of laughter she's experiencing is the laughter we were talking about earlier. When you open a Christmas present that you weren't expecting in a moment when you don't think you deserve anything. And in fact, you actually are given the most glorious thing. That's that moment that the Lord had created for Sarah and for Abraham. There are, they are so happy. They finally have their promised blessing and they finally have their family. But the Lord wants to continue to prove to Abraham the power of true love and charity. And the Lord tests Abraham's love. Abraham has already proven he's willing to let go of the love of things, possessions. He's generous with others. He sacrifices animals to make his covenant with the Lord. He's also proven that he loves others. And now the Lord is going to test Abraham's love with what is called the Abrahamic test. It's a test of what his true love is, a test that requires him and us as we go through our own Abrahamic tests to let go of what we think we want so that we can accept and have room to receive all that the Father has for us, all the eternal blessings and joy that he has prepared for us. The Lord tells us that we must all pass through this type of Abrahamic test. And this test is that Abraham is commanded by the Lord in, doctor, in, excuse me, in Genesis 22, he's commanded of the Lord to go and sacrifice his son, Isaac. Now, again, this is a poignant, painful experience because Abraham was almost sacrificed by his father on an unrighteous, wicked altar to the priests of Pharaoh. 
And so it's possible. We don't know what Abraham was thinking. It is possible that Abraham had faith that the Lord would intervene, that there would be something miraculous that would happen. But Abraham has also been sacrificing animals to the Lord. Those little, those precious livestock that he loves. And I can see Abraham doubting or wondering or questioning. The Lord tells us we must also go through our own tests. In Doctrine and Covenants 98 verses 12 through 15, he says, For he will give unto the faithful line upon line, precept upon precept, and I will try you and prove you herewith. And whoso layeth down his life in my cause for my name's sake shall find it again, even life eternal. Therefore, be not afraid of your enemies, for I have decreed in my heart, saith the Lord, that I will prove you in all things, whether you will abide in my covenant, even unto death, that you may be found worthy. For if ye will not abide in my covenant, ye are not worthy of me. It's critical for us to stay true, even through the difficulty of sacrificing even our very lives. The Lord asks us to serve him that way. Then in Doctrine and Covenants 101, we are invited to learn to love as Christ and Abraham did, surrendering all to God's will and trusting that he will give us more than we surrender. In Doctrine and Covenants 101, verse 4 through 5, it says, Therefore, they must needs be chastened and tried, even as Abraham, who was commanded to offer up his only son. For all those who will not endure chastening, but deny me, cannot be sanctified. The process of sanctification includes sacrifice and love and surrender. But sanctification also prepares our hearts, just like Enoch, to stretch wide as eternity to receive all the Father hath. President Kimball taught that this type of obedience that allows us to make these types of sacrifices is not blind obedience. He taught, quote, the patriarch Abraham sorely tried, obeyed faithfully when commanded by the Lord to offer his son Isaac upon the altar. Blind obedience? No. He knew that God would require nothing of him, which was not for his ultimate good. How that good could be accomplished, he did not understand, end quote. But Abraham knew that what he surrendered, the Lord would compensate him, return to him, restore to him a hundredfold if he continued to have faith in the Lord. What do we learn from all these contrasting degrees of love where Abraham goes and he actually sur surrenders his love of Isaac and goes to sacrifice him on the altar. And then just as about as, as he's about to sacrifice him, Abraham is commanded by the Lord not to do it. What do we learn from this, this complete dedication and loyalty to loving the Lord? We learn that Abraham showed the Lord that he would obey him in all things because he knew Christ always had his best interest at heart. We also learn that worthiness, that perfection that Abraham is commanded to achieve in Genesis 17 is a function of willingness and receptiveness. It's not a function of perfection. Worthiness is a function of receptiveness. It's what we're willing to receive. Abraham's love was a, a form of celestial love, the highest form of love. He surrendered all to the father. Abraham's willingness to love God more than Ishmael and rejecting Ishmael when the Lord told him to, and more than Isaac, when he offered him up on the altar, was the type of love that the Savior exhibited when he was willing to lay down his own life. It's the highest form of worship. It's the highest form of connection. And it's the highest form of celestial divine love. Now, it's totally natural for people to ask, this doesn't make any sense. This sounds crazy. Why would the Lord ask you to do something that hurts someone else? Why would the Lord ask you to do something that hurts yourself? That, that, those types of questions are totally natural and reasonable to ask. And I can assure you, I know this is true for myself. I've seen it happen time and time again. The questions are calmed. The peace comes when you realize that the Lord is trying to give you more that he's trying to help you let go of the fear, let go of those plans that you've made for yourself that are inter interfering with your ability to be your true self. Remember what we talked about with Enoch? The Lord's trying to restore you to be the best version of you. 
He can only do that if you choose to follow him, if you choose to let go of your own plans, your own laws, your own schemes, surrender them to the dust below so that you can receive the gold that he's prepared for you up above. This is because the Lord, like we talked about before, is trying to give us the greatest gift and the greatest gift the Lord gives us, the greatest gift he grants his children, according to Brigham Young, is, quote, the gift of eternal life. That is, to preserve their identity, to preserve themselves before the Lord, end quote. That preservation of who you really are comes as you're able to live consistent with what you really love. When we choose to love things that are inferior or that distract us from our true relationship with God, we choose to define ourselves by those things. We choose to define ourselves by our fear, by our possessions, by our relationships, and all of those things fail. But if we can choose to love God and define ourselves by our love that we feel with him, it's the one thing that scriptures tell us will never fail because his, his pure godly love, his charity never faileth. I testify that Christ knows you and loves you and wants to help you find peace and happiness. I testify that any pain that you feel in your experiences, whether they be the small trials or the Abrahamic tests, that pain is something that he feels along with you. He's with us in our darkest moments. He's calling to us and assuring us that he will bring us safely through any storm we experience if we just keep our focus on him. He's trying to help us learn how to walk on water. He's trying to help us learn how to soar up into the heavens with him. We can do that as we stay focused on him and trust that whatever he asks is meant for our greatest happiness and our greatest joy. He is constant. He is eternal. He is fixed in his righteousness and peace and love. I testify that he wants to give you that same stability, that same consistent fulfillment, satisfaction, and joy. I also want to share a couple of resources for those who are academically curious and want to find their own insights and deeper understandings of these chapters. One of the things that I have found that is a great resource for studying Come Follow Me is an app called the Citation Index that was prepared by BYU. That app contains every single talk ever given since Joseph Smith to the present by any authority, general authority, apostle, prophet, 70, uh, general relief society. Those talks are tied to the verses that we're studying in Come Follow Me. And so you can go look up Genesis chapter 18, verse 1, and you can find every talk ever given that references that verse. It's a tremendous resource for digging deeper and understanding these, these verses and these chapters more thoroughly and gaining even more revelation and light and truth from the Lord. There's also a wonderful book about Abraham that was written by Douglas Clark, and it has a, a foreword by Truman G. Madsen. I met him when I was a lifeguard at BYU. His wife would come in and swim all the time, and she was wonderful. And Truman G. Madsen was a wonderful friend of my grandfather in, in Provo as well, because they both taught religion at BYU. This book, written by Douglas Clark, is the most amazing comprehensive resource on Abraham and contains many of the Jewish and Islamic traditions that I referred to in this lesson. I want you to know that the Lord is trying to give us this light and knowledge. He's trying to help us understand the contours of the human interactions of Abraham and Sarah, of Isaac and Ishmael, these relationships that exist, because as we understand them and their humanness, their pains and their sorrows, and their resulting joys when they lean on the Lord, we can see patterns that the Lord is calling us to, to help us find our own ways back to him, to find our own ribbons of light that he's laid out before us to help us find our way back home. I also want to testify that the Lord loves you and that there is peace and happiness as we endure our trials with him and wait upon the Lord and trust that he's about to give us an amazing Christmas present, especially in those dark moments when none but the Lord can deliver. I testify of these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.